Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call uh, the meeting of Compliance and Enforcement Subcommittee to order. Just take a quick roll. Uh, Mark Gorman. Here. Ashley Manning. Here. I have Corey Gregor. Here. Uh, there we go. Here's. Hi, Ashley. Ashley Reynolds. Just take and roll. <clears throat> yep, present. Ingrid Jonas. I'm here. Thank you. I also see um, David Cuber and Danika Scott as well. Yes. Yes, present. And Kyle, if you could just give me the names of the board members in your room as well. Um, yeah, we have uh, myself, we've got uh, Julie Holbert, a Cannabis Control Board member. We've got uh, James Pepper, Chair of the Cannabis Control Board. And we've got Nellie Marvel, our air traffic controller. And we've got Bryn here, our executive director. And then we've got two members of the public and Brandon King. Brandon King from the uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery. Great, thank you. I just got an email from Tim that he's gonna be running late. Uh, so I expect him to join us uh, later in the meeting. Um, I just need a motion uh, to make, well, I wanna make sure everyone got a copy of the minutes of last meeting, uh, and then a motion to approve those minutes. By anyone? I can make that motion with Ingrid. Thanks, Ingrid. Second. Anyone have any issues with the minutes? Otherwise, I'm gonna approve those and then get to our agenda. All right, thanks. I'll approve the minutes. What I have is uh, obviously we've got a we've got a pretty formidable list of, of items within this subcommittee, and I I ranked that priority list last time. And what I'm focusing on are the local ordinances, uh, including the fees. That's also going to be tackled by the market structure subcommittee. Um, I also have cultivation, seed to sale, uh, and enforcement. Those are the four ones that I wanted to focus this subcommittee to focus on first. Now that you had some time since the last meeting and, and the weekend to digest some of that, um, I'll, I'll take anyone's thoughts on that order that we're going about tackling some of these items. If anyone has any comments on that, I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain it. Okay, good. Um, let's let's jump into uh, local ordinances and fees. And I think everyone, again, we're all reading the, the public comments. Um, we're receiving them and reading them. One of the public comments was talking about changing, it, it was kind of a request to change Act 164 to opt out rather than uh, voting to opt in. And what I want to make clear for everyone at our scope, we're preparing a recommendation report to the board, and then they will recommend, uh, make the recommendation to the legislator. So obviously it, it's written the way it is right now, written for a reason. The fact that some of them, uh, the counties have already opted in means that, that process has started. So it, it's, it's certainly within the subcommittee's power to make recommendations uh, otherwise, but there need to be certain steps taken. I want the public to understand that uh, to actually go in and, and change uh, what the legislation is saying. So when we, we've had some discussion about local ordinances and fees, I wanted to try and put this more in perspective. There, my understanding there's so there's 14 counties in Vermont. Most pop, most populated is Chittenden, the least populated Essex. And when we're looking at deadlines, there's a reason the market structure subcommittee is coming up first for a reason. A lot of other subcommittees like us are, are dependent on that. 
And in, in other states, uh, there are a certain number of licenses determined uh, by the market. And then typically limits are set for each county uh, or area. That's how it is in Washington, Arizona, in Maine, there, there's certain tiers um, for cultivators and they're accepting, I understand, retail on a rolling basis. So there are five or six licenses. So I don't think Tim is on the call yet, but if any of the other subcommittee members have thoughts, I mean, I, I, have, I have notes and questions written down on some of the concerns were, well, we, we have to make sure the fees are covering uh, for the counties what what the effect is going to have and there was the analogy to what's happening with alcohol does anyone uh, and, and I'll, I'll ask Tim this and I can ask him this offline again but that issue how, how is that um, does anyone have any, any input on that any subcommittee members on the county Tom, yep. this is Kerry. Um, and I'm going to suggest we table this until Tim gets here. Um, he really is the expert and the only one with any real uh, weight associated with his comment on municipal regulation. Um, I have opinions, but they might not uh, jive with the sure. League of Cities and Towns. And, and, you know, that's specifically what Tom was here to represent. So. I think um, in terms of your priority list, we jump down to the second thing on your on your list. Sure. Um, yeah. And again, I mean, I'll I'll have uh, conversations individually with Tim and, and whoever else. What what I suggested last time also was, and I understand Tim's just representing one county, uh, and I think Julie's already initiated a survey to the other counties. But but I I want to get some more input and some outreach. To those communities so we, we get a better handle on this so that's that's fine um we'll, we'll come back to to local ordinances and fees once tim's able to join us hopefully the next thing i had on the list was cultivation and i don't know if you've had a chance to kind of review or digest what the nacb model was um at least looking at some of the guidelines certainly there's a lot of other state guidelines on this uh, on cultivation and there are public comments on this mostly as you might expect uh, what are you going to do to protect uh, the small growers in the state um, and what are you going to do to ensure that it's not going to be overrun by um, large agricultural MSOs so as a starting point um, I mean I'm, I'm prepared to at least disseminate within the next week, um, kind of a, a draft model for everyone to at least consider. Uh, and we'll, I think the majority of <clears throat> what we're looking at, it, they'll be for outdoor and indoor grows. I think the majority will probably be indoor um, to begin with, uh, but at least we can get kind of the structure even based on the NACP model of where some of the regulation, what some of the regulations need to address. Did anyone have a question on that? Yeah, on uh, Carrie again, I, I feel like uh, the opposite is true in Vermont. Um, largely what we're hearing from folks is the outdoor model. Um, they want to see that prior. Uh, that's that's actually more important to, to folks here. And it kind of represents what's in place already. Yeah, and I, it's, I don't think Stephanie's on here, but I, I was curious to see. I mean, hemp's a little bit of a different crop. Um, but so, yep, so Stephanie uh, works for me. And right. so we have about four indoor growers and maybe 600 outdoor. Right. Um, and I mean, how, how big do you think those, of those 600, Carrie, can you just kind of break down the the size, the acreage of, of your outdoor growers for hemp? It varies. There's, the majority are less than five acres. Um, we have less than a dozen that are 20 acres or greater. And yeah. some, some of those are reaching a, a 100 acres. Okay. Um, 
Do you have an understanding, I can ask Jim Romanoff this as well, but of, of the, the medical cannabis producers or growers, um, are, are those outdoor or indoor grows of, of those, those five retailers? I, the medical facilities um, all do indoor. Um, right. Two of the licenses last year, they did have outdoor as well behind their building. So CVD had indoor, outdoor, indoor and outdoor. Um, and they were growing for basically three of the dispensaries. Okay, interesting. I mean, I, I would think with... Um, so, you know, our, our sort of back, our home grow law, everybody is pretty much got, everybody who wants to has probably six plants outside. Right. The, the discussions, at least in the sustainability subcommittee, um, are that just the, the weather being what it is in, in Vermont, um, they at least were predicting most of it. And yeah, the, the, cannabis, the, the marijuana plant is, um, is a lot more delicate than hemp uh, and requires much more specific growing conditions. Um, their inclinations were that, that most of the, of, of the grows would be indoor, but um, I mean, I, I need to gather the data and thoughts on, on what that looks like. There, there, there will be, you know, regs for both indoor and outdoor cultivation. Um, but yeah, thanks for that because I, I was, I was relying on what they were saying, sustainability, um, that most of it would be indoor cultivation, at least to get the, the harvest. Hey Tom, I can I can well, speak I can speak to that quickly. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so because I've been in that committee, I know Billy had kind of made um, some assumptions. I know we're making a lot of assumptions, at, at least yeah. from our model perspective. I think you know whether we start with indoor or outdoor from a, a standard or um, compliance perspective is is for the subcommittee to decide. I think the board would like to see um, a mixture of both, but. Sure. Personally, I think you know the model will help us understand from a production perspective where that line is between indoor and outdoor. Um, again, there's there's a lot of assumptions in that model that I'm sure will be adjusted by that subcommittee. There's assumptions that were made in the sustainability committee, just recognizing you know controlled ag environments, um, you know, produce a more consistent crop, so to speak. But but Carrie is also spot on where uh, there's a lot of our market could be made up of a lot of small outdoor or a majority of small outdoor growers and, and where do we strike that balance between the two is um you know something still have to be figured out and i do feel like you know when when we do have an out uh, i believe we're, we'll see people grow outdoor in the summer and then move it indoor in the winter because you can get two crops indoors while you're waiting for it to get nice outside again Yeah. Or, Sorry, Tom. I'm not, I'm not trying to derail the conversation here. I just yeah. think um, we're going to see preference for both, um, sure. especially from the small, small scale grower. We're going to see preference for both. Um, one of the other topics that I wanted to make sure we covered is the requirement for seed to sale. Um, that was originally part of the coal memo. That's more or less now defunct, and I don't think we need a seed to sale system in Vermont, so only because, you know, it's sloppy in Colorado, they use the RFID tags. Um, it, we're not really in a position where we're necessarily concerned about diversion as much as other states were. Um, this, you know, diversion being sales to other states, right? That's what this was trying to keep a handle on. The seed to sale was sales to other states and making sure that it stayed that stayed in the market in the in state. Um, we're seeing bleed from the other markets into Vermont now, so I'm feeling like speed to sale isn't necessarily a requirement that we need to include in 
in a Vermont uh, system. Carrie, but you're willing to hear what other people have yeah. to say. Carrie, I think that's a requirement in 164, though. So we're, we're tied to that. We're tied to that right now. And, yeah, it, it's it's absolutely in 164, and it's actually one of the ones that um, I I selected to be in this kind of top four list um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not aware of a state that doesn't have this as part of the regulations, and it's not just I mean there's a lot of different purposes for it. Certainly, one is to prevent interstate um, dissemination of of the product, but the other one is when the, the market matures, as it's been doing in a lot of states, and the, these businesses want to get things that normal small businesses have access to uh, in order to be successful, like banking services, like insurance services. Um, the, the banks that I know, um, the audits are, are very aggressive and they're very thorough, and one of the things that they tick off first on their list is the tracking and tracing mechanism um, and how vigilant that particular business is with it. And it, you, uh, I think you're going to put some of these businesses at um, kind of behind the other states if you don't if you don't mandate this. And it, it's, it's certainly you know a, a different way of doing business. Um, but you know, as as we grow in legitimacy, um, that that's just that that's how I know banking, specifically insurance, is going to look at this. Very so, good. I just thought it was worth having the conversation. No, I, that, 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 that's exactly what I want because I want to make sure we're all on board with with the reasons um, we have this priority list and and why they they're important and you know. Seed to sale is, is one of the things that I think the license holders need to have in place, um, and I don't think I don't think it's that's a, an item um, that's going to be uh, more difficult only because it's it's fairly prevalent out there, and I don't know if it's necessarily um, you know I don't know if that's one of those things we have to tweak that much for for Vermont. Um, so that, that was another thing I was going to suggest. Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of software programs out there, uh, and you know we're not pitching one over the other. But um, I, I was going to disseminate some model rules for that um, to have you look at and, and see if they made sense. That sound good? Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see Tim yet, so I'm going to move down to. We had discussion about enforcement, uh, and more specifically, who would be handling um, enforcement going forward. And I think it's positive. I mean, the, the way the legislation is written, I think it's a three-year sunset for the CCB, uh, and certainly that can be extended or, or revisited. Um, but. Um, if anyone else has had thoughts, and, and again, there's also the language in the legislation that encourages the board to make use of strategic partnerships uh, and other agencies out there. And I know we, we also do have the representative from the DLL uh, in the room, but before maybe um, we get to that introduction, if anyone else had any other thoughts about other agencies uh, that we can bring in and uh, just kind of drive for what they could offer. Um, Tom, I, if I, Tom, if I may, sure. I don't want to put my colleague from DL on the spot because he came, okay. uh, not intending to, but Dave Huber's on the on the on the line, and he's head of enforcement for the Agency of Agriculture. And I know Brandon and myself have had sure. conversations with Dave on how they go about uh, from a cultivation enforcement perspective and, and other services that they do. Dave, again, I, this isn't my meeting. I'm sitting in and just helping Tom, but. If, for fear of putting you on the spot, maybe um, you know a rough overview of how you approach things with your agency might be helpful for the group. That'd be great. Sure. And uh, you know, hi everybody. I'm Dave Huber, uh, director of enforcement for Agency of Agriculture. Uh, before I jump into uh, anything really, 
uh, about enforcement with agency of agriculture. Are there any specific questions that everybody has? I imagine that everyone has already researched plenty about this topic, and Tom, it sounds like you've got quite the expertise. Uh, are there any questions that you have right off the bat? I actually don't have the Vermont expertise in this. Um, that's why I'm curious. Um, so, what, how, could you just describe how, how large is the, the enforcement um, division? Uh, is there, does that also include kind of, is there an appeals process for that? Just the broad brush strokes for now. Uh, sure. Leaves me a lot. Yeah, sure. So it's, a, it's, a, it's all administrative law. Uh, it's not criminal, it's not civil. Right. Uh, I've practiced all those as well, but this is bread and butter administrative law. Um, so what we have uh, over at the agency uh, is uh, an administrative law section. Uh, we handle all enforcement um, across the board for the agency. So this is for uh, water quality, uh, agricultural non-point source water quality, uh, feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, nursery, ginseng, seed potatoes, um, apiary, uh, hemp, uh, and then we also provide uh, any help to any other division that is looking to start up enforcement, such as uh, maple pathing. Uh, and there's also enforcement that's done through uh, dairy sectors and uh, uh, meat inspection and animal health. Uh, so we do have quite a, a large uh, robust process for handling multiple uh, multiple types of subject matters needing enforcement. Um, as far as the administrative process and appeals, uh, every action comes with uh, its own set of appeals uh, from the lowest level all the way up to the top. Uh, we do have the ability to file uh, any of our actions with the Superior Court. Generally, we choose not to. Uh, it's just a lot easier to keep it in-house than it is to go through the uh, that system. Uh, we find that it works out pretty good. Uh, I think one thing to note is that the HC does employ uh, a very good approach to uh, administrative law enforcement. We do have discretionary, uh, uh, you know, enforcement discretion when it comes to where to start a case uh, and uh, how far to take that case. Uh, we do have MOUs in place with other agencies, uh, Agency of Natural Resources, uh, Attorney General's Office, just in case we have a case that uh, we would like to uh, bring another agency in on. So having an MOU or a process there for to, to help bring that case uh, to fruition is not uh, unique with, with any agency, but certainly the Agency of Agriculture already employs such a, a technique. So I just wanted to add to sort of that process. We we do inspection in the program. So we have strategically placed field staff throughout the state who will do an inspection. If they find a violation, that case comes to the office for enforcement review. If they have a violation, it gets referred to the enforcement section. They take that, send out a letter of a notice of violation with an opportunity for a pre-hearing or a hearing. Generally, it'll be a pre-hearing process. If it's not settled in a pre-hearing, it goes to a hearing with a hearing officer. Um, but uh, we've got a pretty good track record of <clears throat> closing these cases with assurance of discontinuance documents um, at the pre-hearing level. Thank you both. So, and it's my understanding from, from Stephanie that the hemp program has its own investigation and enforcement, or, or did, have you assisted? It's with the that? same. Oh, it's the it's same. It's the same, yep. So every, you know, all Stephanie's cases go through me. Uh, anything dealing with any of Carrie's cases go through me. Uh, and we try to settle as many cases as possible, as long as they're uh, right for settlement. Uh, we'll take them uh, the entire way if necessary as well. So, so David, it's your field agents that do the investigations or inspections of for, for the hemp farms? Uh, Mike DiTomaso is one of the uh, uh, hemp 
uh, inspectors who reports to Stephanie. Which, which I was trying to describe, the, the field agents are in the program and the enforce, it, we're a little bit uh, broken up. It, it's the same, it's the same agency, but the program staff do the field inspections and that gets referred to enforcement if there is a violation. They've handled um, that end, but I'm willing to use the basically six positions I have right now to do in inspections and enforcement at cannabis facilities because it will be a joint because they already do nursery inspections they already do pesticide inspections um, this is a good fit for the that field staff and we would utilize that field staff in the enforcement process that Dave has outlined now the report that the previous Cannabis uh, Commission put together for the governor two years ago envisioned a model where the agency did the consumer protection and quality control for the the growing, the processing, um, and the Department of Liquor and Lottery maintained enforcement authority over the licensing and retail uh, inspection of cannabis product. So it was a combined effort split um, where the agency of ag took it up to the point of, of growing, processing seed to the point of sale and those because liquor and lottery had experience with municipal government interaction as well as the sort of under age verification process that they would do the retail inspections and enforcement. So it would have, we would have, the agency of ag would handle um, growing processing and all, all the nursery inspection, seed, seed certification type part of the program, the consumer protection quality control piece and liquor and lottery would handle the enforcement of underage sales and retail, whatever else came along with a retail inspection. That was what was proposed to the government in the last report. Okay, thank you. And sorry to keep, I think it, it may seem like I'm asking the same question, but um, so the, the Stephanie Smith under the hemp program has her own field agent that does the inspection or investigation. And if there's a violation, then the enforcement is sent to David. Do I have that right? You do. Okay. Um, and do you have any idea how many how many field agents that uh, it, are within the hemp program? Mike, one. One. Okay. One. But I have more that I'm willing to devote to cannabis inspection. Right. Okay. Uh, Carrie and Dave, can you, this is Ashley, I just, I was real just curious if you can even ballpark this, but like in the four or five years that this program has been, and the hemp program has been enacted, how many cases a year are we dealing with here? They go to enforcement? Yeah. Zero? I don't know if we can talk about that. Um, oh. Not in ballpark? I mean, not who. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, who, <laughs> there's been some significant enforcement actions, um, and you've heard a bunch, heard about a bunch of them in the news over the years. Um, most of the violations are letters of warning about registration. Right. Um, there have been instances where folks are growing something other than hemp. And those are the ones you hear about. Those are our sort of bigger enforcement cases. Yeah. Okay. Just curious. And I can't say how, I don't know exactly how many, um, Dave, are you aware of how many letters we've sent out to folks who have not registered? Uh, for this year or for last year? Or combined, both is fine. Uh, so uh, probably, uh, probably around 20 total just for, for that specific. Uh, infraction. Uh, most of those do result in uh, compliance very quickly and are closed out as soon as we ascertain compliance. 
which sometimes is just as simple as receiving a check or uh, or just having the appropriate registration uh, completed. What about on the on the medical side? Is there is there a dedicated field agent for that as well? Uh, yes. And, and yes, and that's with the Department of Public Safety. Right. Okay. But and the enforcement does that end up with you as well, David, or it depends on the on the violation, I, I suppose. If it's something that goes to public safety, we we do not have uh, enforcement for that. But we have had referrals come to us from public safety, and we have referred cases to public safety. Right. So if there's um, so right now for the medical program, if there's a violation, at least with something on the on the growth side or the cultivation side, that's that's being investigated by a public safety agent? That very much depends. Right? Other agencies are involved. The the only thing that the medical program really latches onto is diversion. Diversion of product. The consumer protection quality control piece doesn't exist, but okay. all of their growers, all of the medical facilities do have certified pesticide applicators, and we have enforcement over their pesticide use. Okay. Use storage inspection. So the pesticide piece is with the agency of ag. Um, the weights and measures piece, like if you're selling a, an ounce, it needs to be an ounce. That's with the agency of ag currently, but the, the diversion and regulation of those medical facilities, medical cannabis facilities, is with the Department of oh. Public Safety. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's, that's extremely helpful. Um, Mark, did you have any other questions with, with the existing structure? No, I, I do not, Tom. You're doing a good job. Tom, can I provide a, a comment from a board level perspective? Sure. So, um, Please, and, and Dave and Carrie, if, if I'm wrong in my rough back of the napkin numbers based on our previous conversations, let me know. So, I know, you know, if somebody calls and complains about the hemp program for one reason or another, that's something Mike may go out and investigate. It's also my understanding that Mike typically tries to get out to 20% of registered users in a calendar year. Uh, okay, good. That's that's a correct number in my head. I think it would be helpful for me as a whole. Go ahead. Yes, twenty percent was is is an accurate number. Probably. So I know Carrie is kind of waiting to see our market analysis to kind of see if if, if we were to come into an understanding um, with the agency of agriculture and their enforcement team to to um, you know provide resources to hire more inspectors or devote more time to this emerging market, what it would look like. But I think it would be helpful for the board for the subcommittee to determine, you know, if Mike's only doing random inspections of 20% right now, what would that random number look like for the high THC cannabis market? Would there be enough consumer protection and community safety aspects to where we're only randomly inspecting 20% of, of license holders a year? Does that number need to be higher? Does it need to be 100%? Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. I think that's something that the board is interested in understanding more of. Kyle, I feel like the uh, sampling um, and the testing and sampling requirements are going to drive some of that, and they're going to drive it really close to 100%. Totally get that. Just you know, what number makes sense? I'm just I'm just throwing it out there. It might be that 20%. Um, I just I would love to to get all the smart minds on this call <laughs> to help us make that determination. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Because I know that will also drive those resource numbers, Carrie. You know. Yep, yeah, I do. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't think. Um, I mean, there's still some time left uh, for Tim to join us. But 
Uh, Tom, there's one more thing I just wanted to add real quick, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, when it comes to uh, to the division that handles this over at Agency of Agriculture, uh, as far as the all the you know uh, public health and agricultural resource management division topics, uh, which it sounds like this would probably be uh, fitting into that if that were the case, uh, all the agents that Carrie was talking about outside of uh, Mike, who's strictly uh, hemp, they are cross trained uh, in all the other programs that the agency does do and does do enforcement for and does ascertain compliance. So if they go out to an area and they see something that might be a violation, but it's not a violation of the program for which they're going out there specifically for, it would also be an internal report. And they may go back out there with, uh, with the hemp inspector. Uh, and likewise, when the hemp inspector has been out to, to other farms and see something that might not be a hemp uh, violation, but does see something you know, that triggers uh, hey, this might be a violation of another program that the agency does do. Uh, the internal referral is very simple, uh, very easy. Uh, it's a very watered down version of our referrals to outside agencies or outside uh, counsel over at uh, Attorney General's office. So, uh, you know, we already do have this in place with the Agency of Agriculture where uh, there is a very, very broad knowledge of all the uh, programs. Uh, that are run uh, jurisdictionally through agency of ag good very good that, that, that's helpful thank you and, and karen what what were the numbers again on the, on the number of field agents you had it's up in the air uh depending i need to see what the resource demands are um could be potentially six that's without asking for positions from the legislature okay Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to, most of what I had to discuss was, was on kind of local ordinances, and I, I know we, we still don't have Tim. Um, but what I go, was, go, let's hear what you had to say, Tom. And I, yeah, I was well, hoping to have a dialogue on recorded with Tim recorded just so it would be on record. But uh, yeah, let's yeah. hear what you put together. Well, it, it was more, mostly more just information gathering, and, and we do need to have that um, that conversation in, in the meeting. Um, but if, I, if we're looking at 14 counties in Vermont, um, and Tom, let me just I, Massachusetts has county governments. Vermont has no county government, so we do have individual towns. So we we don't have a there's nothing in in a county that pulls that county together in a governmental model <laughs> unlike massachusetts um you know we're dealing at an individual town level so it's 246 towns not not 14 counties yeah and, and that's exactly what i was trying to get get a handle on because tim was saying the last meeting in some of my conversations different towns, different counties at different level of resources. Um, I mean, even his, you know, his, his county, his town, it sounded like he said, yeah, we, we've got everything on board. We've already opted in. Um, and, and the survey will, will go a long way uh, towards getting a, a better handle on this. But what, what does that spectrum look like? Um, even within, if you're talking 240 plus towns, um, what are the level of, of resources? Because at the end of the day, uh, they're gonna have to put their local ordinance together themselves, um, particularly the zoning, on how they want, how they want to control some of this. Um, and that's gonna drive a lot of the success of the program. So, yeah, and I think that's going, the, the zoning, the zoning happens on a town basis, not on a county. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and maybe this is, um, uh, yeah, maybe these are conversations, Julie, that, that we need to have with, with the survey and getting that information because I want to be able to help Kind of steer the the education of those those towns if that's what 
it, the level it's going to come down to. Um, and also find out what the level of, of receptiveness is um, or knowledge is of, of what's being what's going to be rolled out. So I would say that um, the survey, yes, and then maybe also hearing from the League of Cities and Towns. Uh, not all, but many of the towns in the state of Vermont are, have a membership of the League of Cities and Towns, and they could probably give you a pretty good overview of what that depth and breadth of a town is in terms Great. of their resources. The League of Cities and Towns. And Tom, while I, I, I spoke to what the governor's, the previous report to the governor had stated in terms of breaking out a three and enforcement, but since uh, folks from Liquor and Lottery are in the room, I, it might be nice to hear from them if that, that's still a scenario that they would entertain. Because um, I don't know. The, so for the, for the record, he showed up as a member of the public. I, we, we did not formally invite him, so okay. I, I fear too much to put him uh, on the spot, but to, to the extent that you have any. Yeah, I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to just speak with that real briefly. I mean, I think that that model, to me, I'm, I'm not in a position to make decisions for us, obviously, but I think that that model makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the agency of ag uh, clearly has that in their wheelhouse to, to manage the crops and stuff where, where we would be much better positioned to handle the point of sale. Yeah, and, and Carrie, just so you know, I, I have had um, conversations also with, with DLL uh, and they are, they are willing, um, certainly to lend resources, uh, not just on um, kind of the the growth side of it, but also uh, with with licensing um, as well, and, and we'll continue to have those those conversations. Yeah, Tom, I know we're all kind of like a broken record here, but uh, they are my conversations with Skyler, who's kind of the head of enforcement, excuse me, yes, enforcement at DLL. Like everybody wants to see our market analysis, what we're looking like in terms of expected number of licensees to the extent that we're able to provide that in October to kind of get a handle on resources and what might be required um, for, through an MOU from a, you know, cost sharing perspective. Yep. And that is a meeting coming up in just a couple hours here uh, as well. Um, I, I've also noted and I have our general counsel looking at um, title, I believe it's title seven, where DOL gets uh, enforcement jurisdiction and what type of legislative fixes might be appropriate um, to include those inspections when it comes to how liquor and lottery uh, functions as a, as a state agency. Good, good. Um, yeah, and as I said, I mean, there are states, uh, in, in Washington, it's, it's called the Department of Liquor and Cannabis, liquor, um, and certainly in Nevada and Las Vegas, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of control. Um, and from the liquor side, that model is out there as well. We have about uh, we have about five minutes, so I wanted to open it up. Uh, I also want to try and leave about ten minutes for public comment. Um, any other topics that the advisory committee members want to bring up, um, and then I can kind of give us the action items for for next meeting. Um, that I want to address, and I'll try and get hold of Tim between now and then as well. Nothing? I've stunned everyone with the <laughs> level of information that we got. we're going to have to digest and get ready. So what I will do then, as far as action items, um, I, I will have a conversation with, with Tim, um, trying, just trying to get some more information and data uh, from his perspective on on the towns and the, and the counties. Um, I will also send out kind of a more comprehensive version uh, of cultivation, breaking it down between outdoor and indoor cultivation. Uh, and also, um, I will send out, just as far as reference materials, some models for seed to sell tracking legislation as well.
anything else anyone wants to add? Um, because each each meeting now, I, I, I want to keep going through these four items. Uh, how it fits in local ordinances, cultivation, city sale, and then more thoughts and ideas that we can give a good solid recommendation on how enforcement can look going forward. Okay, um, this time I'll open it up for, for any public comments. Anyone in the room might have, Carl? Um, yeah, we have one. Hi, uh, Dave Silverman. I'm the High Bailiff of Madison County, and that's what counts for county government around here. Uh, I have no duties, so uh, yeah, no power. Uh, I'm also an attorney in Middlebury, and I've been um, actively involved in, in getting this legislation passed for the past six years. Uh, Tom, I, I just wanted to give you some feedback. The, the idea of, of pushing uh, a legislative fix from opt-in to opt-out, I, I mean, I just think you're um, going to be wasting a lot of political capital on, the, on an effort that will never succeed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's opposed by the governor, uh, and it's opposed by the, the town lobbying organization, and I think you're going to be swimming upstream on it. Um, and it, it, look, I, I completely appreciate that the current system makes it very difficult for towns to get retail in. Uh, getting a vote uh, is a complicated process, um, particularly when your local boards uh, are not in favor. As it was in my town, it was very difficult to get the vote, um, although we did it. Um, I, I think you might find more success if you were to focus on getting stronger incentives for towns uh, to opt in, uh, such as by having some local revenue sharing, uh, maybe not quite as much as what VLCT was asking for last session, they were asking for 5%, uh, but if you made a more reasonable ask, you might find a more reasonable response from the legislature. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Good? All set, yeah. All right. Any further comments? All right, I think that's it here in the room, Tom. Appreciate it. And, and just to clarify, um, that was another public comment uh, regarding the opt-in and opt-out. I'm, I'm glad there was a, a response to it. Um, certainly, I'm not personally pushing one, one way or the other, uh, but those those comments are out there. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to add? Tom, I would just I would just say in, in broad strokes um, when it comes to you know I know Tim um, we're, we're talking a lot about fees I think what might be important for this subcommittee to help the board with is a model local ordinance on how towns that don't have real municipal government and they exist in, in Vermont and look to the state um, and we can do that through the LCT um, as well. Um, but, but what what is this going to look like? What does local control actually look like? I know the board needs to to make that determination as well. But from a local ordinance model perspective, um, that we can share with towns to the extent that we can, that's something that would be important. So I think separating the fee conversation at points from just what does this look like from a local control perspective, that that differentiation will hopefully help get, you know, get things done. Uh, understood. And it, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging to develop a model local ordinance for a town. Um, it's not giving any feedback that, that I, I, you know. No, I get it. I know these have. are a big part of that, but well, what kind of control do they have on advertising? What kind of control do they have on areas where retail can actually take form and brick and mortar perspective in a town, that, that kind of stuff. I just don't want that to get lost in the, in the fee conversation. Sure, sure, understood, understood. Still have a little more time if anyone has another issue, otherwise I'll, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Um, work on getting that material out to everyone. And then meeting again on Thursday. Can I get that motion? So moved. So moved. Any second? 
Second. Great. Thank you, everyone.